Perfect. Thank you. So team, uh, my name is Cody. I'm also joined with Mike. And Mike, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, Mike Stefaniak. I'm the uh, product manager on the Nginx Gateway Fabric. Perfect. So team, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about the Nginx Gateway Fabric, but uh, we're going to start with an overview uh, of what the Kubernetes Gateway API is, why it was uh, created, some of the challenges that it helps to address. We'll go into detail about F5's uh, implementation of the Kubernetes Gateway API, and then we'll jump into a quick demonstration. So quick introductions. So uh, I have been in industry for uh, almost three decades. Uh, and throughout that time, I've been in both development and operations. And these three challenges have always been things that I've faced through that time, right? The security of my application, the scalability of my application, and the complexity of the deployment. So like most of you, I may have started in monoliths and you know, trying to move my monoliths to three-tier applications. I actually cut my teeth on Sun Netris, if that helps date me at all. And over time, we start to uh, find that this is really hard to do, right? My deployments are heavily scripted. It takes forever. My maintenance windows are like entire weekends. And so we started to evolve how we were deploying applications and designing applications. And that slowly led to the creation of three tier and eventually microservices. And through that time, we also went from bare metal to virtualization to container-based deployments. And most of us have now standardized on Kubernetes. It's predominantly what Mike and I work with customers on. And really team for me, that addressed a lot of my initial deployment complexities, right? Now I can do upgrades in substantially less time. Um, I can use things like progressive deployment patterns that allow me to do rollouts or rollbacks or self-healing or canary-based deployments to really get a better understanding of how customers are using my applications. And this is predominantly where we see most customers are either starting fresh with container-based applications deployed in Kubernetes, or they're slowly migrating their applications, right? We work with very large uh, organizations that they still have some portions of the app that live on bare metal, some that live in virtualization, and some that live in the container. So it's important that they're able to ensure that these services can all communicate together. And one of the ways that we do that is by using a load balancer inside of Kubernetes. So a couple of basics. Um, when we talk about Kubernetes, there are a few things we need to understand, right? One is that a Kubernetes is a cluster. Um, and inside that cluster, we have um, several nodes. And those nodes could be either physical bare metal machines or virtual machines. And when we talk about deployment of the applications, we typically are looking at a pod. That pod has containers that are running our workloads inside of a node. And then we publish a service. There's a logical grouping of pods that perform uh, the same functionality. So, you know, Mike and I may be deploying our, um, you know, uh, let's say the subnet calculator application that we've written for internal customers to use inside of our organization. That would be maybe a couple of uh, uh, pods that are running the individual containers that we need, but that service would be our subnet calculator. But all of that exists inside of Kubernetes, right? And so our users don't live in Kubernetes. We have to get that application out to them. And one of the ways that we can do that is by ingress services. And that's how we provide layer seven load balancing either by a host uh, name or URI. Now, when we talk about the load balancer, how we expose that application out to our users or to the world, there are a couple different ways that we can do that. Uh, when I was first cutting my teeth on Kubernetes, I was introduced to NodePort. And most people start this way. It's a very simple way to deploy an application. In this scenario, I have three services, my Pine, my Lagoon, and my Deep Lake. Now, on each one of these nodes, I have to ensure that I know that the port I'm going to deploy is available. So node port means that when I write my manifest and I send it to the Kubernetes API, I'm going to specify that Pine is gonna listen on port 30,001. Um, the reality is, is that you may not always know that this port is available or what ports are available on your production Kubernetes cluster. So it's not terribly scalable in a production level environment. 
The other things we see in challenges here is things like ensuring we have uh, a common health across all the applications. So in the diagram, you can see that this Pine service on Node 2 is not healthy, right? And Node-based, uh, Node port services don't have the integrated health checking capabilities that we would really want to look for and take advantage of in Kubernetes for a production environment. So most customers cut their teeth on an ingress service. And so an ingress service deploys or leverages an ingress controller. In this scenario, it helps remove the complexity of understanding what the port is, right? So I'm not telling it which port to listen on the node. The ingress controller is working with the Kubernetes API to determine that. I also have the ability to distribute the request across all of my nodes that the service is deployed onto. And I do have the ability to check the health status of the service. Now, keep in mind, this is simply that the uh, service is running. It doesn't give you any advanced capabilities such as synthetic monitoring. And so while this definitely reduces my complexity for uh, deployment of the application, there are still some challenges that I run into when hosting a production application in Kubernetes. And so one of them is going to be connection timeouts and errors leading to a poor user experience. An ingress service by default isn't going to help me necessarily overcome this. I can try to spread my traffic out across more um, nodes or try to scale it dynamically, um, but there's, there's still going to be some challenges around that timeouts and errors and the ability to not really see the underlying health of the application or the performance of the application. I may have a service on a particular node that is running hot. And by default, the uh, load balancing algorithm isn't going to be able to take that into account. Uh, the next thing we look at is securing it, right? When we talk about either node port or an ingress service, we're simply providing layer seven connectivity to the app. We're not actually adding any type of application security to do things like rate limiting or to make sure that our application is not being exploited. Next, has limited governance um, and self-service capabilities. So if Mike is setting up the cluster and he gives me the ability to deploy an ingress <clears throat> service because I own the subnet calculator app, well, I can pretty much deploy what, what I ever what I want as an ingress service, right? I have full capabilities and that may not be Mike's intention, right? Mike may want to be able to say, hey, Cody, you can publish new routes, but you can't publish new services. Where we've seen this be a problem is, you know, for most customers, if I say, you know, f5.com is an application, my users just think of it as one app, but really behind the scenes, it could be hundreds or thousands of microservices. And if I'm able to update the ingress that is deploying f5.com, then I could potentially take down all the services. And that's just not a good outcome that we're looking for. And so we really want better governance so that I can only impact uh, the service that I am responsible for. And then finally, increase complexity in tool sprawl. So there's things that customers try to implement to overcome some of these challenges, but it ends up causing more complexity and more challenges down the road, which are harder to troubleshoot, harder to deploy, and, and really team harder to maintain as we are upgrading our environments or deploying uh, new clusters in new regions. So some of the ways that we overcame these in the past is by using custom ingress controllers. So Nginx ingress controllers, the most deployed uh, Kubernetes ingress on the market. Um, you know, some of the ways that we look to help overcome these challenges is by adding custom annotations. Now, these annotations allowed us to get around the limitations of the underlying ingress service API, but they were specific to Nginx. And so if you were to then go and deploy inside of Azure and use an Azure ingress, it would have its own custom annotations. Now, some of the ways we, we try to extend that is that if Mike and I were using those custom annotations, I was able to add things like rate limiting. I can add capabilities such as a web application firewall, but the annotation is not actually validating that what I'm giving it through the API is correct. So I could actually crash the ingress service because I provided a malformed uh, configuration. And so this is where the custom resource definitions or CRDs were implemented to help extend the Kubernetes API, but provide the intelligence to ensure that I am giving a valid configuration. So this really did help address a lot of the challenges that we've outlined so far. However, 
you still had limitations and those limitations were extensibility, right? So every time we wanted to add more capability to the ingress, it was either through annotations or a unique CRD. And again, team, those were custom to each vendor that you were deploying ingress from. While we were able to add governance to the Nginx ingress controller, as a whole, we didn't have governance in the underlying Kubernetes API for networking services. And so you were dependent upon each provider that was giving you network services to implement that governance and to be compatible across, which we do our best at, but really it works better if there's an underlying uh, format or, or SIG that we can uh, you know, develop to. And some customers found that you know, they were doing both ingress and service mesh to try and address the pain points they found with uh, the uh, ingress service. And the service mesh did help us add additional security, but it also added additional complexity. And so what we found is that customers were having to deploy large service mesh packages like Istio, but they only needed a subset of the functionality. And so a couple of years ago, um, the Kubernetes community decided that we, we wanted to look at a new way that they could uh, just address the challenges around both Northwest or ingress services, as well as East-West and the service mesh. And this is where the Kubernetes Gateway API came into play. Now, the Gateway API in itself is a collection of resources, right? So it helps address the module services uh, or network services inside the Kubernetes cluster. But the important thing to think about is that the Gateway API itself is not an implementation, right? It is a standard that vendors like F5 Nginx are able to build towards. And it allows us to define both um, uh, an implementation across this, that functionality, but also the ability to extend it in a way that works for customers, regardless of the underlying technology. So that means that if you deploy natively into your on-prem Kubernetes and you're using the Gateway API, you could have Nginx running on-prem and you may decide to deploy in Azure and use Gateway API. And the same deployment would work there because we're both uh, mapping to the underlying API spec. And so when we look at the ingress, so the uh, Gateway API is not replacing the ingress controller, but it does provide a lot of the similar capabilities around network services. And so we still have the north-south uh, capability to deploy an application, uh, as well as additional capabilities coming around the east-west. So being able to implement similar service mesh uh, offerings inside of the Gateway API. Again, this is all managed by the uh, SIG networking community. And the really cool thing about the, the, this is that this is both users as well as vendors like F5 coming together to outline what we feel is necessary for the community to move forward and to make things easier for customers and users of Kubernetes in the future. And so I'm really excited about the Gateway API because it allows our customers to standardize on one implementation and know that they're going to be compatible going forward. It also is extensible in the sense that there are some things that just have not made it into the SIG yet, and some of those being like app security. It still allows vendors like F5 and Nginx to be able to add the app security, but then also work with other vendors to ensure that in the future, how we're implementing security via the API specifications is compatible across, pardon me, compatible across all implementations. So that means that you're future-proofing your investment and the operations, because the reality is, is that your operation complexity is just as important as the deployment solution, right? And what I mean by that is that most of the time where we spend a lot of our effort is helping customers reduce operational complexity, operational toil, and making sure that they're able to automate either through you know, scripting or through pipelines, a lot of the processes that they have to do to deploy their apps and really embracing that shift left mindset that they're able to give their app teams the ability to do this in self-service. And so the Gateway API has solved a lot of the challenges that I've been working with customers on the last seven to eight years. So when we look at where did it solve some of the problems around the Ingress API? Well, one of them is role orientation. Um, so I touched on this briefly, but um, I, I've worked with a large web scale customer that 
uh, they have a very large uh, presence around um, the holidays. And so in their scenario, um, they can process uh, so much traffic uh, regarding their e-com site that their number, but anywhere between number four and number five in the world uh, on, on traffic on those particular days. And the application teams that were performing upgrades were going in and manually editing their configurations. And so the reality is, is that they've had scenarios where an individual developer who is simply trying to update a microservice, maybe in the search or the cart, actually took down the entire e -com site. So you can see why that's not advantageous, right? Really what we want is we want that user to only be able to update the route that they are responsible for. And so now with the Gateway API, we have the ability to separate those roles and responsibilities allowing us so that Mike may be responsible for the entire platform and the cluster, and he defines that ingress or that gateway, um, but then I'm only responsible for, let's say, slash cart slash checkout, right? And so if I submit something that's bad, I'm only impacting my service. I'm not taking everything else down. Um, the other thing is around the expressions. So um, we can really get away from annotations to be able to extend uh, the capabilities. Um, so when we look at the Gateway API, the core support for traffic policies with custom annotations is, is there. Um, and we can change the, uh, the implementation. Uh, you know, so you can deploy a configuration uh, using uh, Nginx. You can deploy a configuration using uh, another provider, and the Gateway API will uh, work across those. You're not having custom configurations that are specific to us or specific to them. Now, I do want to be clear, right? There are some things we'll talk about in Roadmap. Not all capabilities are, are first-class citizens yet, right? And so we still have the ability to do uh, custom extensions to the Gateway API to add that functionality. But we're working with the SIG to ensure that how we implement that is done in such a way that when the SIG does ratify an update, so for example, like application security, that we're all you know, address, uh, implementing that in the same way so that it's easy for you to add that and then make sure you're future-proofing your investment. Uh, so in the Gateway API, the support levels of optional features are core, extended, and implementation specific. Uh, we can get into some of those here in a few minutes when we talk about some of our roadmap and where those integrate. So I wanna dig in a little bit deeper into the role orientation. So when we look at the object design in the API, um, you are going to have your gateway class, which defines what implementations are available in the cluster. So all, I mean, I would think about this as your infrastructure provider does this. So this could be done through, let's say you're using OpenShift, and this may be uh, deployed as part of your core OpenShift environment. Um, now, once I have my uh, infrastructure deployed, I, I need to be able to uh, uh, create a gateway itself. Now, in this scenario, I may have a cluster operator. So uh, you know, just circling back real quick, a gateway is a definition of some infrastructure to be created. So think of the, you know, I tie my FQDN or that ingress to the gateway. So this may be where the cluster operator or in most environments, this may be what the platform operation team is doing. And they're setting up that gateway for everyone to use. Now, the benefit with this is that it's being done at the infrastructure time. Now. The other thing is that the gateway is only providing access through the cluster. So meaning that I have access to the cluster, but in a lot of organizations, there are northbound security devices or additional load balancers that are providing traffic disaggregation across multiple clusters. And so this may be something that we need that platform operation team to be responsible for because they're able to ensure that we're stitching that uh, IP address that's providing ingress into the cluster all the way out to the internet if you're providing a public application. This isn't necessarily something we want the individual application team doing because they could be bypassing your security policies or your deployment policies that are set forth in your governance. Now, as a developer, though, I still want to be able to self-service, right? I don't want to have to put a service now ticket in and wait, you know, 30 days, 40 days to get my app deployed. That just doesn't move at the speed that I'm updating my application. And so think of the gateway can be deployed once, but then the application developers have the ability to deploy their HTTP routes on their own. And so as I add new functionality to my services, I can do this without having to go back to the platform operations team. And so the route allows me to deploy both an HTTP, TCP, TLS, UDP, or gRPC service. 
And so um, this is really powerful for me because this means that now if I want to deploy my uh, infrastructure as part of my pipeline with my app, I can do that, right? I just simply target the Kubernetes API and I have the ability to define that. And so if I'm starting a net new service, then I would work with Mike, who might be the cluster operator, to define a new RBAC capability and a new, a new uh, FQD intergateway that I would deploy to. And so um, you know, this really helps map that route to a service. And when we're talking about microservices where there could be hundreds or thousands of microservices behind an app, it gives us that separation of duty or separation of uh, control that makes sure I don't take down that large e-com site in the future. So kind of just uh, bringing it all back onto the table so you can see it, we have the gateway class, we define our gateway itself, and then I'm able to define the HTTP routes that map to the individual services behind them. So as I mentioned, the gateway API is a specification. It's not an implementation itself. And so that's where F5 Nginx created the Nginx gateway fabric. So what is the gateway fabric? Well, it is a gateway API implementation using Nginx. As I said before, the Nginx is the most deployed ingress controller in Kubernetes today. And we wanted to take a lot of our proven capabilities and provide that as the gateway API as well. So Nginx just recently celebrated its 20th birthday. And uh, you know we've been in this for a long time, providing application security, application availability. Uh, we're also the most deployed web server on the market. And it's all in that same uh, uh, you know, binary. And so the power behind this is that that data point is very extensible and it has a lot of capabilities that help address business challenges, whether that's through our open source offering or through our paid offering, um, your ingress controller and the gateway API support both. So this means that we have the gateway fabric pod and inside of that is the control plane. Now that control plane is responsible for listening to the Kubernetes API and looking for the gateway API um, calls that are coming in. And then based upon what the user is providing, we then are configuring the underlying Nginx data plane accordingly. So I still have all that uh, RBAC or, or role uh, separation between the cluster operator and the application owners being handled by the Kubernetes API. It's no longer handled by the Nginx Ingress or you know, uh, any other uh, individual provider. Um, the other thing we can do now as well is as I have applications that are being deployed, I have the ability to separate those either based upon uh, FQDN or PATH or header cookie. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, extend the capability of what you're trying to achieve. Now, one of the things that really makes Nginx powerful is the ability to um, you know, do some of the progressive deployment patterns I was talking about earlier. And not all of those are available as first-class citizens in the Gateway API today. But as you can see at the bottom of the slide, we talk about snippet functionality for any directive not yet as first-class. So that means that we have the ability to extend some capability of that service so that you can add additional features like rate limiting or a web application firewall if you needed to. And the, where we're trying to move is making it simpler for customers to deploy this across all of their environments. So one of the things that we've been working with customers on the last, I would say probably six years, is moving necessarily the applications out of their core data centers and moving them more into edge cloud or edge uh, location uh, services. So what I mean is uh, if you walk into a grocery store and you know six or seven years ago and you had an app that was telling you uh, what the store offered, it was looking at the database and trying to determine what it thought inventory was at the store. Now we work with customers where we're actually looking at live inventory at the store itself. So that mobile app is communicating with an edge service that lives inside the store that has real-time data on updates, real-time data on what's happening. Other ways that we've seen this implemented is as customers refactor their three-tier applications, a lot of them use message buses. And so the message bus may still live in the cluster on-prem, but they're deploying new applications in a cluster inside of Azure. And so how do we ensure that we can communicate and deploy our services identically across those and still provide access into 
the uh, message bus on-prem. And so I, I, I'm, again, I'm excited about what the Gateway API provides because we can extend that Gateway API to add some of that service stitching capabilities that isn't quite there in the SIG that, that will be coming uh, hopefully in the future. Um, but there are some capabilities we'll touch on now around scenarios and use cases. So some of the basic things you would wanna do with an application as you deploy is uh, looking at how we're routing the traffic coming in. So the easiest way to do that, of course, is URI and path, but you may want to do more custom routing beyond that. For example, um, a lot of customers want to do canary-based deployments so that I can distribute a percentage of my services to a new deployment and slowly ramp that up. Now, we could do that either based upon uh, just weights that we send a percentage of all traffic between the uh, two versions of the service. But you could also do that based upon attributes that we see inside of the request, such as a header or a cookie. Um, the other thing you may want to do is HTTP redirects or rewrites of the headers that are coming through. This is something we'll demo. Um, a common example I do with customers around this is regarding security. If there are particular headers that you are looking for on your backend services, and that your security devices are setting, we wanna make sure that we don't have injection of those headers as we come into the environment. And so, you know, this is an area where it's probably one of the top things that you would look for from a security exploit uh, perspective that I'm not injecting sensitive headers before I hit the ingress service. And so we can strip those headers out or we can modify them as they come in. And that way your backend application knows that you are getting um, you know, authoritative headers coming from the ingress or from the gateway API. Another common way that this is used is regarding authorization. Um, zero downtime deployment strategies. So this is really, again, more of those progressive deployment patterns, making sure that from an application user perspective, they're not noticing any changes or redeployment of our services on the back end. Observability is something that we're continuing to add additional functionality on. Um, you know, this is an area where when we talk about the default ingress service, there, there's not a lot that we could uh, necessarily get from the API around the app itself, right? I don't have the ability to do advanced health checks. Um, but with Nginx, I can add additional health uh, inspection of the service, as well as get additional data out. And open telemetry is an area that Nginx is investing more into to make it easier for you to take that data and then use it across any of your products that you're using for tracing or for insights or your SIM. Um, access control and TLS, right? So when we look at encryption, uh, making sure that you have uh, all of your applications today should be using TLS encryption. They should be uh, you know, working with a known certificate authority and rotating that out. And we also are seeing more and more requests to implement the um, uh, MTLS encryption between services themselves for east to west traffic. And we'll touch on that in just a second. And regarding the access control, um, uh, one of the things I, I've, I've kind of been uh, talking a lot for years on, we shouldn't be doing just access control and authorization on our public apps. We should also be doing them on all of our internal apps, right? And, and it's always on someone's to-do list. Like, yeah, yeah, we, we want to do access control on our internal APIs. We want to do authorization on our internal APIs, but we're, we're just not high enough priority, right? We want to focus on the DMZ first. Well, the challenge that we're seeing now is that everyone is rushing to do artificial intelligence inference and training. And when we're developing these things internally inside of our environment, what's the first thing they're hungry for is data. And so we've seen a lot of uptick over the last 18 months of customers going, oh, all of a sudden my internal API is just getting hammered. It, it's just blowing up. And the reason is, is because a crawler found it in the internal environment and started to extract data out of it. And this is where we really want to be implementing that access control in the Kubernetes ingress or in the gateway API so that we're able to ensure that only the services we want have access to our API. And secondly, that we're doing authorization to ensure that we don't have unauthorized uh, you know, requests coming in and taking that data. This team reality is today is that the, the proprietary data that you have in your APIs is the differentiator you will provide when you start to build services that are using AI inference, right? Because at this point, that data is more valuable than almost anything else. And it's what customers today are really 
concerned about when they start to do things like AI training or AI inference. Because you know, the reality is, is that as I deploy that model into production, it is deployed just like any other modern app. It is an API call that's going to the inference server that's providing the data back. And those uh, API point endpoints are commonly being deployed on the internet or internal into environment without any protection, without any access control. And these are ways that we can simply uh, or easily de uh, define that without a lot of complexity, right? It's, ba it's baked into the product. Um, it's just a simple directive that you can add. So uh, let's get into roadmap real quick and, and what we're looking at. Um, one of the things that we see a lot around authorization is the implementation of the Open ID Connect. And so we're trying to make that much easier for you to provide authorization to an API um, using uh, JSON Web Tokens. So OpenID Connect is a, a fairly common uh, standard across all environments. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you can implement this, right? One is that you can have Nginx do the JOT authorization and uh, validate that the API call is coming from a known source and then allow it to the back end. And we can inject a header so that the back end app understands that you know this is a trusted source you can allow this api call to go through uh, the other thing uh, we can do in some more advanced configurations is we also have customers that need to be able to accept jots from multiple sources but they don't want to have to configure their back-end uh, microservice to be able to understand all of those and so in that scenario we use something that's called jot transformation and so we can uh, accept a jot at the ingress from multiple providers, but then turn around and sign an internally trusted jot to communicate with the backend service itself. So if that's a scenario that you'd like more information on, feel free to uh, ping me in the chat. Um, uh, we mentioned earlier about the Nginx snippets. So this is coming in our next release in November. And this is an ability to add Nginx capabilities to the Gateway API that are not first-class citizens yet. So a good example of where we're trying to go with that are things like the web application uh, firewall. Um, you also see the WAF protection is on the roadmap. This is an area Mike is working with the SIG and, and uh, trying to make sure that you know, how we implement this is also uh, common across all vendors. Because team, you know, reality is, is, you know, if you remember back to the three challenges I had, you know, security was one of them. And we have to always be considering how our applications are being deployed initially in a secure manner, right? We don't want to add security after the fact. We want to make sure it's always there. And honestly, for me, this is one of the reasons why I've been a huge fan of Nginx through most of my career, is that the same security mechanisms that I'm using in production are the same security mechanisms I can run on my laptop, right? I can run Kubernetes and the ingress controller, the Gateway API, right here on my laptop as I do development. Uh, I'm not trying to push something through a pipeline and see if security works later on. I can determine if I'm getting blocked as I develop my code. And that's really the cheapest time to be able to fix security vulnerabilities. Because as that vulnerability gets further out into my deployment, it's more costly to resolve it. It takes longer to resolve it. And so by implementing security in the ingress or in the Gateway API, you're able to address those sooner. Another trend that I'm seeing a lot over the last two to three years is the, the, the Kubernetes public API or public uh, IP address is no longer buried in the network, right? I'm seeing a lot more where the ingress service is actually a public IP address, meaning that the Kubernetes cluster is right on the edge. It's not sitting in a DMZ, it's not sitting in an internal network. And the reason this is, is because we're seeing smaller and smaller clusters that are being deployed in multi-cloud environments. And so that could be where we're deploying in Azure AWS, but we also see scenarios where we would be deploying on IoT or edge servers that live in, like I said before, a grocery store or a particular warehouse. And so being able to apply common security policies across all of those is a lot easier when I can do that at the cluster itself versus having to always put another security device in front of the cluster. And then one of the things I think that gets really interesting is around egress control. So a lot of times we get caught up on how we provide traffic 
into the cluster, but then we forget that the services in the cluster can also communicate out to the world. And typically what happens is we'll just simply you know, put a default firewall rule that says, no, you can't talk to anybody. But the reality is, is that as we see more and more edge services, these edge services do need to communicate with either external SaaS providers or with our internal services. And so being able to provide egress controls as part of the Gateway API, I think is a really cool uh, way that we can help address that going forward. Um, and then I had mentioned earlier the secure app to app traffic. So predominantly when we work with customers around service mesh, this is the number one feature that they were leveraging. They just, they needed that automated encryption between service A to service B inside of the cluster to make sure it wasn't happy in clear text. But then they were having the overhead of trying to deploy Istio to do that, which if you haven't had that, uh, that luxury yet, uh, Istio is very powerful, but it's also very complex to get up and, and going. And so if all you were looking for was MTLS, the Gateway API uh, is gonna be a much easier way to implement that as that becomes a first class citizen in the API. So Mike, I'd like to bring you back in and, and say, you know, are there are there other use cases or scenarios that um, you think that I, I've missed? And, and as a reminder, Mike is the product manager for the Gateway API, or sorry, Gateway Power. Yeah, no, thanks, Cody. Uh, the only thing I was going to add is on sort of the OpenID Connect, JWT, that whole space. Um, one thing that we've realized is it's one thing to say, hey, we can validate your drop token or we can validate your um, OAuth 2 flow or things like that with a web server use case. Um, it's another thing to say, well, we have to scale up. We have to have two or three or four instances of Nginx in order to uh, support the amount of traffic that we're seeing. And so the only way that really works, at least with the like the web server OAuth use case without having users to re-log in every time they happen to hit another instance of Nginx is to share the state between them. Um, so what I've actually moved up in, in the roadmap very recently, actually hot off the presses, um, is the runtime uh, state sharing feature that Nginx has. Um, it is an Nginx plus feature. So it's kind of like, you know, a lot of the stuff you get for free. Um, and then as you scale up, as you're like, okay, now we've got quite a bit of traffic. Nginx can handle a lot, just even with a single instance. But as you scale up, um, anything that that uh, Nginx Plus provides, such as the runtime state sharing, we're going to be able to cover you there with that, again, that, that scalability um, concern. Perfect. Um, including rate limiting as well with that. So we want to introduce that feature with rate limiting, hopefully earlier in the year, um, probably like the first, I want to say like March, around March, April-ish of 2025 for that and rate limiting. Because rate limiting is a really common one as well. No, great point. Um, I th think those are the big ones. Yeah, those are the really big ones that we hear consistent feedback on. I know a lot of people um, are asking about Mike, we literally just want MTLS or TLS between our applications and nothing else. And I'm like, oh, you know, just out of curiosity, you know, why would you not use like a, you know, a linker D or like a lighter service mesh to accomplish that use case? And it's just because, well, we don't have to, we don't want to have to deal with another tool because we have all of these other tools that we have to manage and that we have to, you know, if you want support for it, well, it's a different contract. We got to make sure a team owns it. And I'm like, Oh, you know, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, and so what we're going to try to do is, as to approach to that problem is try to provide as lightweight as an experience as possible. I mean, that's kind of what we designed the whole thing around, around Nginx Gateway Fabric is being very lightweight, being, hey, we're designing everything around the Gateway API. It should be very intuitive, very easy to use. Um, the same should apply to this app to app traffic, which is a bit of a complicated feature for us to make simple for you guys to use. Um, so that way you can just enable it and then boom, you know, everything's, everything's secure within your, within your cluster. No, that's great. I, I think you know, one of my favorite uh, Steve Jobs quotes is it's much harder to make things simple than it is to make them hard. Yes. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Lots of that. Lots of that. <laughs> I hope you guys appreciate it. This, this, we're, we're, we're really, really uh, happy with ourselves in terms of the, uh, the UX we're able to deliver with the gateway API, just cause it's, it's, it's fantastic. If you guys haven't used it yet um, over ingress, it is just, head and shoulders above um, the, the experience of ingress, at least for if you've got multiple teams in your cluster. If you're just one team and you just want to completely control all of the traffic in one team and you just have your own cluster, ingress is a, a bit simpler. You probably don't need the other use cases for it, but. Yeah, I think that's a good segue, right? Is, you know, where, where can we help you now? Um, and so 
you have the Nginx Ingress controller that is available today, as well as the Nginx Gateway Fabric. So to give you an idea, the Gateway API uh, went uh, GA, I believe, almost a year ago at the last KubeCon. And so, you know, it is definitely ramping up. We do see more customers looking to put it in production. Um, but the Ingress controller has been out there with uh, a maturity of over seven years. So um, to Mike's point, if it's, you know, just a single platform team, you're the only one that's doing all the deployments, Ingress controller may be the better way to start with right now. Um, the Ingress controller or the Ingress service is not going away, right? There's no indication right now that they're going to deprecate it in favor of the Gateway API. Um, so it is possible to run both on your cluster um, and, you know, you can migrate as necessary. Um, both of our implementations of the Ingress controller and the Gateway Fabric support Nginx open source as well as Nginx Plus. So Nginx Plus is our paid for product. Um, you can, however, uh, get support from F5 Nginx on either the open source or plus implementation. So if you work in a particular uh, vertical that does require, um, you know, governance or support contracts, these are things that we can assist you with. And then finally, uh, uh, Nginx has recently launched their Nginx One uh, solution. And part of Nginx One, so think about Nginx One is a uh, commercial model that makes it simpler to uh, purchase uh, Nginx, whether that be for uh, functionality or for support. Um, so reducing the number of SKUs, we went from like over 230 down to just a handful, I think about five or eight, which is really easy for both you, us, and our partners. Uh, but it also implemented our new Nginx One console. And so this is a SaaS uh, service that provides visibility um, for uh, your Nginx instances and for virtual instances and container-based instances, it can also do configuration management. Um, in upcoming releases, it will be able to provide that insight and uh, telemetry on both Ingress uh, services as well as uh, Gateway API. And so um, you're welcome to use this with either paid or open source uh, versions. But a lot of our customers have already built their own tooling. And so we provide very extensible APIs to be able to integrate with your own analytics or SIM solutions um, and be able to do monitoring or tracing. So you don't have to consume F5 service. You can simply consume uh, the APIs that are built into the product and get those natively into the uh, you know, telemetry or uh, SIM solution of your choice. Um, we also do have our Nginx instance manager for the customers that uh, want some additional functionality, but are not uh, able to use SaaS service. So this may be uh, closed or protected networks. So, so with that, I'd like to jump into a quick demo, show you some of the capabilities. Stop my share. And we are going to see if the demo gods are still in my favor. All right, so we have a Kubernetes cluster that's up and running, just to give you an idea. Uh, I have uh, done an alias of k equals kubectl, just to make a few things simpler, um, but we'll say our get nodes. Uh, so you'll see that we have a cluster uh, with three nodes um, that we're able to deploy our services across. The first example is very simple. We're just gonna get a basic service up and running and we're gonna uh, provide access to that service um, so this is something you could have done by a node port, ingress, and now we're going to show it by a gateway API. So I have uh, a cheat sheet over here just to make things faster. This is like a baking show. It's already ready. And basically what we're doing is deploying our coffee service in the default namespace, right? So very simple, hopefully not something you're doing in production. You should not be using the default namespace, but uh, we're trying to just get up and running pretty quickly. Uh, so right now we can see that we have it deployed just to show you that it is working. We have our uh, service is running and we have a good status and we are using the cluster IP address, but you'll see I don't have any external access to the service yet. So this is that challenge I talked about that our users need to get access into the Kubernetes cluster. And we do that by uh, deploying either a load balancer, either that being an ingress or gateway API. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and deploy our gateway. So the Nginx uh, gateway fabric is already installed in this cluster. So that's a step we've taken beforehand. And what I'm going to do right now is configure the gateway. So you'll see that I'm creating a new gateway. We're calling it Cafe Gateway because we're deploying our coffee app. And it is an HTTP-based load balancer listening on port 80 with a host name of coffee.lab.f5npi.net. So my gateway is ready to go. Now I can check my health of my gateway. Um, using my Kubernetes Git CTL. And what I'm looking for here, <clears throat> pardon me, 
is a couple of things, right? One, you'll see the same information that we saw earlier, that we have allowed routes, namespaces, what port we're listening on. And one of the things I'm looking for here, though, is that gateway is accepted, right? So I actually have the gateway up and running, and my configuration is valid. So now that my gateway is available, I need to define my routes. So let's take a quick look at what that does. So in this scenario, I'm creating a new route called coffee. I'm specifying what the gateway is going to be. So remember, we created the cafe gateway. And I'm looking for any path that is slash coffee is going to use the backend service of coffee on port 80. Now, remember, I'm deploying in the default namespace. Again, please don't do that in production, but you know we're, we're doing demos here. So uh, my, gateway, my, uh, sorry, my uh, gateway API and my service are both in the same namespace. So it's able to communicate with that. So where we sit at the moment is we have our service deployed, we have our gateway API deployed, and we have our route deployed. Um, I can show you the route status real quick. And so you'll see that our path is valid. We're ready to accept traffic. So let's do a quick test. We're just simply gonna use curl. And you'll see that we uh, got a response back that's providing the server address the URI that we uh, requested. So again, very basic example, not that hard to get up and running. And the reality is, is that from a developer perspective, I would have just deployed the last um, you know, manifest, which was the, the route. So let me clear this up. We'll get into something a little more challenging and probably something that's a little more realistic. So in reality, when we talk about the separation of responsibilities, um, the gateway API is going to probably exist in a namespace separate from where my apps and my services are being deployed. So we're going to do that right now. We're going to deploy a new service, and this is going to be our retail service, and we're going to have a new app that is called Hats. Now, you'll notice in this case, we're deploying it into the retail namespace. So this may be a namespace that Mike has set up for me as a developer that I have access to. I can deploy my services in there, um, but I don't have access to anything else inside of it, so I can't deploy into the default. Um, now, from here, though, Mike decides that, all right, we're going to deploy our gateway for the cluster. And the gateway, you'll see, is being deployed in the retail gateway namespace. So again, the gateway and the service were deployed in two different namespaces, which is more likely what you will do in production. Uh, we are, uh, as before, listening on port 80, and this is an HTTP load balancer with a uh, host name of hats. Um, so now that Mike has that deployed, um, I've deployed my service, I need to define my route. And so I define my route like I did before, I tell it, you know, that I'm in uh, deploying the retail HTTP route. Uh, it's an HTTP uh, selector. I'm looking for slash hat, and I want you to use the hat service in the retail namespace. So it looks good. Should be good to go. My application should be available for my customers or my test teams to start using, but wah, wah, doesn't work, right? Why doesn't it work? Well, it doesn't work because the Gateway API and the app are in two different namespaces. And that's division of responsibilities, right? We want that. We don't want the Gateway API you know, communicating across namespaces that it wasn't previously defined to do so. So one of the ways that we can get around this, or sorry, not get around that, that's a bad reference. One of the ways that we address this is by actually configuring the Gateway API um, with a reference grant. So what this means is I'm specifically telling the Gateway API and the Kubernetes API that the Gateway API is allowed to communicate uh, with my retail namespace. So this is security by default, right? This is what we want. We don't want it open to the world. We want it closed by default. So now if I run that same test, you'll see that I get my API and now I have a clear or good communication with the backend app. Um, so, you know, to me, this is huge. From a security aspect, I just drastically increased the security of my cluster. It means that I can't have rogue or shadow applications that are using the default ingress on my Kubernetes cluster without me knowing about it. I, as a platform team, specifically configure the reference grants to ensure that we are only publishing the apps that we know about and that have been approved or scanned or meet our compliance. 
So I'll go ahead and clear up this example. The last one I wanted to get into is a common pattern we see, which is request header modifications. So with that, we'll clear this out. I'm deploying a new service. Now, uh, this service looks a little bit longer, right? And the reason is, is that we're actually uh, uh, deploying a service with Nginx and we're adding in some NJS code uh, to be able to, or sorry, we're adding in some uh, custom configurations for the uh, Nginx web server to respond back with header information. So now that my service is up and running, I'm going to deploy my gateway. This will look very similar from before. We're deploying uh, an, a gateway class of Nginx. It's an HTTP uh, load balancer and listening on port 80. Now, in this case, you'll see I didn't define an FQDN, right? So this gateway is listening on uh, for all traffic coming in. Uh, I'm going to deploy my new route. And we have a few new things inside of this route uh, definition. So we have some rules now that we're going to match. And so from a path, what I got, we're going to do request header modifiers now. And so in this scenario, I have a couple things I can do. I can set, I can add, and I can remove, right? So I'm going to set a, a header of my favorite band today, and I'm going to add a header of my list of bands and then I'm going to remove the user agent. So I am a huge fan of, of implementing this in your production environments because there are going to be headers that you're looking for in the backend service that you don't want injected from the client. And so this is an easy way to, again, increase the security of your apps. So we'll do our request. I'm going to add a curl. And so I'm going to say my list of bands is Led Zeppelin, Rush, and my favorite band today is Muse. And so I click uh, enter, but what we see is the ingress, or the gateway API in this case actually modified it. And so my list of bands was added, uh, Black Sabbath, but then it changed the band to the frailties, right? So this is how, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny example, but it's a, a good example to show what some basic principles you can add to uh, the gateway API or to an ingress to enhance your security. So team, with that, uh, we are at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll jump into some of the Q&A. Are these manifests available for testing, evaluation, and studies? Um, Rahul, I, 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 I'm guessing in regards to what the Gateway API implementation from uh, FI, which is the Nginx Gateway Fabric, it is all developed open source. So uh, you can see exactly how we're implementing. I think he's um, talking about the ones you use for the demo. Oh, oh, the demos. Uh, the manifest yes, uh, files. We, 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 can, we can get those uh, available and uh, uh, we'll make sure that you can have access to that if that's what you're referring to. Um, let's see, with the functionality being available in the OSS Kubernetes, will this functionality be available in the OS Kubernetes Ingress Nginx? Uh, everything we talked about is already a part of Nginx Ingress Controller, right? So because it's been on the market much longer, both the you know, Nginx uh, Ingress has two flavors. It has the open source version. It has the paid version. I do want to indicate there is the community version that's the community um, version yeah, okay. <laughs> that he's talking about. So, yep. And so the community version, if I if I have all my ducks in a line, uh, it does use Nginx in the name, right? To help reduce confusion, I believe they're going to be renaming that. Um, so we do not maintain the community version. We do try to help from time to time, but we maintain our own open source version of Ingress uh, that you can use. And we have seen uh, massive adoption of that over the last uh, five to six years. Um, so everything that we've shown today is available in the Nginx open source ingress, um, e even the ability to have role separation. Uh, yeah, then we'll, we'll share some of the example and the dots um, as a follow-up. Any other questions? All right, I wanna provide one link real quick real quick. <laughs> and so if you'd like to get more information around the Gateway Fabric, uh, please feel free to visit that website. And looks like we had another one come in. Uh, Node-based approach will work with cluster managed, uh, sorry, cloud managed Kate's nodes. They don't have it yet, but uh, imagine EKS on Fargate. 
Um, yeah, there was a previous question about uh, our approach to securing all the traffic on the cluster. And I had mentioned that there is a node-based approach that we're exploring. Um, and yeah, theoretically, it, it, I mean, it doesn't matter what the, the nodes are built on, it should um, it should still work. Uh, it's it, like we're not we're not intending it to be like oh it should be only for physical clusters or something, um, but we have to kind of explore all of the different use cases and the different ways that it appears like in like kind of what you're getting at that the cloud cloud managed stuff um, to really dive into it. So we have like a we kind of have a powwow we're all going to meet the whole team's going to meet in January to discuss how that's going to work um, because again the encryption in clusters is. Do we just want to make a service mesh and bolt it on? Like that's exactly what you didn't want. So we're, <laughs> we're trying to make something that's um, more lightweight than that. We're hoping we might be able to. I'm hoping we're, that OBS approach should work, um, but that's something we've got to we got to fully explore. And I again, I, this is one of the things I love about the Gateway API is that there's a SIG behind it, and you have all the vendors that are building capabilities are working together on what that specification should be. So you know you don't have vendors just going off and doing their own unique implementation. All right. Well, we're almost at the end of the webinar. I want to thank you for attending today. Um, I believe our information is will be available to the uh, participants. So if there's anything we can help you with or you have additional questions, feel free to reach out. We're available to help you anytime. So I'll hand it back to our host. Thank you so much, Cody and Mike, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. See y'all.